by your mighty power to send us from all adversities that may happen to the body and from all evil thoughts that may assault and hurt the soul. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our first reading is from Genesis, the 32nd chapter. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him, as he passed Pinul, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. O Lord, have mercy upon us. Thanks be to God. A reading from Romans, the fifth chapter. Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. More than that, we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. O oh Lord, have mercy upon us.
the Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew. Lord. Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. By the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, we are bold to confess. I believe in God, Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered the cross of God, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen.
It has been a long time coming, and Jacob is worried. They were only boys, Jacob and Esau. Esau, the oldest, the eldest, the rightful heir to the promise and name of their father. Only a boy, when Esau despised his birthright, he traded it to his younger brother for a bowl of soup, and that was only the beginning of the drama. With the conspiracy or the co-conspiracy of his mother, Jacob was sure to get the blessing from his elderly father, who had lost most of his vision and couldn't tell which son it was. They work out how to get the father to do God's will, even though the father apparently is set to not do that and give, bestow his blessing upon Esau. And the whole thing gets predictably ugly. The father finds out when it's too late what has happened. God's will manages to be done with the help of a faithful mother, and Jacob becomes the heir to the name, the lands, to everything, the glory of his father. And Esau, who had despised his birthright, is cut out, and even though he had despised it, he is not happy about it. It separates the family for years, and Esau, before he leaves, makes this vow to his brother that the next time you see my face, I will surely kill you. It's a nasty scene. They go their separate ways, and years have gone by. Jacob has done quite well building up the flocks, the lands and things that belonged to his father. He has done quite well being married and having his own offspring. Things have really gone his way and the Lord has blessed him. But Esau is still out there and the threat still exists. Certainly in the mind of Jacob, the threat is certainly real. And Esau has not sat idle. He has taken a couple of wives and a multitude of kids, his flocks and herds and lands. He's every bit as great, perhaps greater than his brother. He went out and did it on his own without the blessing of their father, without the inheritance. And now in the middle of a relatively peaceful and wonderful life, Jacob gets the news that as they are semi-nomadic and wandering around these lands, he's about to brush up against the territory of his brother or vice versa. And he hears through his spies he sent out that not only is Esau near, but Esau is riding out. He seems to be aware that his brother Jacob is near, and he comes out with 400 men under arms. 400 of his hired hands, his extended family, the power that Esau has built up for himself. Him and 400 men are riding out, and Jacob makes plans for the worst. He begins to evacuate across the Jabbok River. Being the good leader that he is, he sees everybody across, and he remains alone behind. He will be the last to cross to safety. With all of this anxiety of what the future holds, will he escape? Will he be caught? What will his brother be like after all these years? And what about the vow that he was going to kill him when they saw each other's face again? I think the context for all this is important because as you see throughout the traditional church year, we get this reading here smack in the middle of these events without the scripture telling us these events. It's contingent on your pastor to tell you what's coming before, has come before than what is coming after because it seems really bizarre in isolation. Having sent his family across the river, staying alone behind, possibly in prayer and meditation for a brief spell, suddenly God appears. God appears, the messenger of the Lord manifest in flesh at the time of the radical reformation, and you will find paintings of this event called this, there came about the view that Jacob wrestled with an angel. But that is not the view of antiquity. Until the Radical Reformation, nobody took it that way. Or Hosea later references this, and he uses the word messenger, which can mean angel, but it was always understood by the church in antiquity that this is God in flesh. This is Jesus, risen and glorified and eternal, no longer bound by time and space. He does a number of things. He appears to Abraham before Sodom and Gomorrah with the Father and the Holy Ghost. 
He appears to Abraham in a person that is called Melchizedek, again, in his glory, triumphant. And Jesus goes back and appears here at this point. This critical moment when Jacob, the son of the promise according to God's command, is scared. He's scared about what has happened. He did some pretty shifty things to his brother, although God had told him to do it because his dad wouldn't do the right thing just because he should do the right thing. It's a little bit hazy. Did I sin? Did I sin against my brother? Does he have good reason to hate me? But I did it for the Lord. Did I do right? And does it matter? Because as much as we as sinful people hate it when our sins come back to haunt us, the truth is our righteous deeds done in faith are just as or more likely to come back and haunt us because this is a sinful and fallen world. Whether he was right or wrong, what things he did that he shouldn't have done, all of that is academic, but it's got to be tearing up Jacob inside, knowing that his brother is coming. And what, what will his past not only bring on himself, but should his untimely death at the hands of his brother leave his family without him, what happens then? What happens to his wives, his children? What happens to everybody that works for him? What happens to the future? He's wrestling with God, you see. He's already doing it before God appears to him in the flesh. He's having these thoughts and this angst. Did I do the right thing or didn't I? Did God really say? Did I hear him right? Did I understand it correctly? Did I do the right thing? Does it matter? Am I going to die anyway? Sometimes we die for doing the right thing. And then what happens to my family? Why, Lord, did it all have to go like this? Why couldn't it have been better, smoother, easier? He's wrestling with God in his conscience. He's wrestling with God in his heart. He's wondering, and God shows up and does this wonderful, perfect, warrior king straight out of antiquity. The man needs to be distracted from his angst, so God attacks him, and they have a wrestling match. He distracts him with some good old-fashioned Spartan Greco wrestling. Now, that didn't exist yet. But then God shows up and says, oh yeah, you want to argue about it? You want, you want to fight? You want to wrestle with God about what has happened? Here I am, let's just do this. And he gives him the distraction of a physical competition. The really neat thing is when you realize that your enemy could defeat you whenever they felt like it, and they were toying with you. And so this goes on for this long, protracted period of time, and finally God just touches his hip, and his hip goes out, which is like the worst. He puts his hip out with just a touch because he's God, and he still doesn't let go. There's a fascinating moment here where he has been wrestling with God in his heart and mind, he is wrestling with God in the flesh, and God has put his hip out of joint, but he won't let go of God. He's got a hold of him. They've been wrestling. We don't know what kind of wrestling hold he's got God in, but even putting his hip out doesn't make him lose it, and he hangs on for dear life rather than being defeated and insists on getting a blessing. God allows him to work this out in this decidedly unusual, but decidedly manly fashion. Jacob won't let go of God, and it reminds him to never let go of God. And now he has seen the fulfillment of all the promises God had given to Abraham and to Isaac and to him and to his posterity forever. He has seen the one who is descended of his own body in the distant future, the one who will die for the sins of the world and rise triumphantly who now glorified comes back and blesses him again. As God had bestowed so many blessings on Jacob, God appears, Jesus Christ wrestles with him and bestows upon him his blessing. The incredible thing, and one of my favorite parts of the Bible comes immediately after. Because he has stayed true to his faith, and he has stayed true to his God, and he has finally trusted in the Lord and not let go of him to say whatever happens, happens. Sometimes we die because of the wicked things we've done and we have it coming. Sometimes we die because we've done the right thing and stood by the Lord and if that's how it has to be, so be it. And so he stands by it. And after this event, after this blessing by the Lord, he gets ready and Esau with his 400 men are approaching and Jacob decides to take a stand and he tries to appease his brother first. 
He sends flocks and herds to him with people to heralds to announce that these are gifts from your brother. These are gifts from your brother. And the tension continues to build up. Will his brother be bought off by the gifts? Or when his brother finally arrives, will he have his way with him and kill him? And when his brother does finally show up, it's one of the most gospel moments you will find in the Old Testament. Esau comes up and hugs him and kisses his neck and says, Brother, it has been so long. What is this business of you sending me these gifts? What were you thinking? He doesn't want to take them and has to be talked into it. See, time, life, maturity have made Esau into a better man. He long ago learned that his brother was right, that God was right, that his mother was right. He has long since enjoyed the fact that he has been blessed with wives and children and with flocks and with lands, and he has let it go. It is water under the bridge for him for a long time. Even as his brother Jacob feared what would happen when they saw each other again, it was so far in the past, it was forgotten. And this beautiful gospel moment of the reconciliation of these brothers, but again, it comes as the blessing. It comes after he has wrestled with God in person, received this gift and this gospel that comes the next sequence of events. And it's so fitting how we do this ourselves. We wrestle with God to try to understand it and figure it out and be able to put it all together. We compare God to our science and our physics and try to figure out how does all this work and not wanting to admit that it's beyond our comprehension. We don't like the fact that living in a sinful world means horrible, despicable things are happening every instant. And we want to feel that God should intervene, but God doesn't do that. Because if he struck those people down, he'd have to strike us down too, because we are all sinners. We fear our past sins coming back to haunt us. And yes, our righteous deeds can come back to haunt us. We fear sticking up for the gospel preaching the message and word of Jesus Christ. We fear saying no to evil when it is manifested because we don't want to get canceled and harassed and bullied and kicked off of Facebook or despised by our family or whatever. Whether good or evil we have done, we fear what happens when it comes around because we are always like our father, Jacob, wrestling with God. There's a cool footnote to all of this, too, that carries with it some great gospel assurance. I mentioned that it is often misreported since the Radical Reformation that this was an angel. But it is also often misreported what the name Israel means. Usually we hear that Israel means wrestles with God or struggles with God. And that goes back to our friend the prophet Hosea that talks about all of this in the context of the wrestling match and the struggle later on. But what it actually literally means in Hebrew is God rules or God prevails or more likely better translation, you can't say it in English, the continual condition of the prevailing victory of our God. In the present tense, that continual prevailing victory that makes Jesus king. This is the name that he's left with after God has blessed him because he won't let go even when his hip is put out of joint. It is that reminder that whatever we have done, good or ill, whatever the world intends for us, good or ill, whatever past comes back to haunt us, the future gospel of the reunification of the two brothers for whom it is all water under the bridge, God has been reconciled with man by the atonement of Jesus Christ, that risen and glorified Christ who goes back to see Abraham, who goes back to see Abraham again and goes back to wrestle with Jacob and bestow upon him the name of God's perpetual triumphing. Without time, without space, the reminder that Christ has made all things right in the future to share that gift with our ancestor in the past, even as he continually shares it with us in the pre present. This is the perpetual prevailing of God who is infinitely winning the victory in Jesus' name. Amen.
and have mercy. O Christ, hear us. Hear us. God the Father in heaven, have, have mercy. God the Son, Redeemer of the world, have, have mercy. God the Holy Spirit, have, have mercy. Be gracious to us. Spare us, the Lord. Be gracious to us. Help us, good Lord. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the craft and assaults of the devil, from sudden and evil death, from pestilence and famine, from war and bloodshed, from sedition and from rebellion, from lightning and tempest, from all calamity by fire and water, and from everlasting death. Good Lord, Lord, deliver us. us. By the mystery of your holy incarnation, by your holy nativity, by your baptism, fasting, and temptation, by your agony and bloody sweat, by your cross and passion, by your precious death and burial, by your glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter. Lord. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death, and in the day of judgment. Help us, good Lord. Lord. We poor sinners implore you to hear us, good Lord. Lord. To rule and govern your holy Christian church, to preserve all pastors and ministers of your church in the true knowledge and understanding of your wholesome word and to sustain them in holy living, to put an end to all schisms and causes of offense, to bring into the way of truth all who have erred and are deceived, to beat down Satan under our feet, to send faithful laborers into your harvest and to accompany your word with your grace and spirit. We Lord. Lord. To raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand and to comfort and help the weak hearted and the distressed. We implore you to hear us, good Lord. To give to all peoples concord and peace, to preserve our land from discord and strife, to give our country your protection in every time of need, to direct and defend our representatives and all in authority, to bless and protect our magistrates and all our people, to watch over and help all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation, to protect and guide all who travel, to grant all women with child and all mothers with infant children increasing happiness in their blessing, to defend all orphans and widows and provide for them, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, and to have mercy on us all. We implore you to hear us, the Lord. To forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers, and to turn their hearts. To give and preserve for our use the kindly fruit of the earth, and graciously to hear our prayers. We implore you to hear us, the Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God. We implore you to hear us, the Lord. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Have mercy. Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Grant us your peace. O Christ, hear us. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. Amen.
Lord be with you. Let us pray. O Lord, our God, who dwells on high and who guards the humble of heart, who sent forth as the salvation of mankind your only begotten Son, our Lord and God, Jesus Christ, look down upon your servants who have bowed their heads before you. Keep us steadfast in that simple grace, your washing of regeneration. Keep us united with your holy church and numbered with your flock. For blessed are you on the throne of glory in your kingdom, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and to the ages of ages. Amen. Amen. The Lord Almighty bless us and direct our days and our deeds in his peace. Thanks be to God. The Almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Bless and preserve you. Amen. Amen. Amen.